Has this been tested here in Dubai before? This is the first time ever. This is the first time. Okay, guys, ready to release the bird. Okay, just give it a second. Here she comes, guys. Josh, is all yours. Come on, girl. I'm Josh Gates, and this is an experiment I've always wanted to try in a place I know very little about. I'm giving myself 12 hours from sunset to sunrise to experience Dubai in one <laughs> outrageous Here comes the shock. night. Be careful. This is Josh Gates after dark. Welcome to the Arabian Desert. This landscape has remained unchanged for thousands of years, just as you see it now, this endless sea of shifting dunes. But then, about 30 years ago, something really extraordinary happened here. A city popped up out of nowhere, seemingly straight out of the sand. Welcome to Dubai. By the light of day, it's a place famous for opulence, luxury, and architectural marvels. The Burj Khalifa stands proudly here as the tallest building ever built. There are days when its highest point protrudes above the clouds. But my mission over the next 12 hours is to see Dubai from a different view. Summed up in a word, nocturnal. With the sun on the horizon, my countdown to sunrise starts right now. As I navigate out of the desert, I follow the highway into the city, making my way south along the coastline and onto an unusual plot of land, where I finally reach my first destination, a hotel. But it's not just any hotel. This, all of this, is actually a hotel room. This is the Royal Bridge Suite at Atlantis the Palm, Dubai. Probably the most luxurious hotel room in the city. More than 3,000 square feet of opulence. And it could be yours for the low, low price of 30,000 US dollars a night. I'm told Kim Kardashian stays here when she's in town, so I'm flattered to be in the celebrity suite. Even the soap in this place is made out of 14 karat gold bling. Maybe expensive, but the view is absolutely priceless. And what's really extraordinary about all of this is that it's man-made. I'm not just talking about the hotel, but the entire island is artificial. In fact, it is the largest artificial island on the planet. It's known as the Palm Jumeirah, and when seen from above, it is actually the shape of an enormous palm tree. What's really nuts is that they built this entire thing in less than 10 years. It's home to the Atlantis Resort, but also to about 4,000 luxury villas. And from here, at the very top of the palm, you have an unbroken view of the entire city of Dubai. Speaking of which, I have to get changed. I only have one night to explore it. This adventure gear won't work for Dubai, so I change into, well, the only other clean clothes I've got. Dubai, here I come. My first destination is just downstairs. It's not the five-star restaurant I'm interested in. The signature attraction here at the hotel is the aquarium, and it's hard to miss. It takes a staff of 100 people to keep this aquarium alive. It's all done at night, and tonight, I'm here to help. Rob. Josh, hey, how, how are, are you? you? Do I want to shake this hand? Yeah, it's just a bit of fidget. It's fine. <laughs> I won't hurt you. How are you? <laughs> yeah, good, thanks. You are in charge of this huge aquarium? Yes, I am, yes. I think you might have the best job in Dubai. 
Yeah, well, uh, they had a vote a few years ago in Dubai who had the best job in Dubai. And actually, I came in at number two. I was, I was being to the number one post by a travel writer. A travel writer? Yeah, exactly, yeah. Look at that. Yeah, I know. I think you have a better job than well, I do. We'll see at the end of the evening. Yeah, I think you might change your mind. Yeah, you get to hang out at an aquarium yeah, all day. I think, I, think, I think you do have the best job. <laughs> yeah. This is one of the largest saltwater tanks in the world. It holds 500 different species of marine life. Walk through the hotel and it's everywhere you look. Thousands of fish, stingrays, and even potentially deadly sharks. In the wild, most predators hunt for food at night. So here, every night, Rob prepares a massive seafood buffet. How many pounds of food a day are going in this tank? We prepare about 700 pounds a day. 700 pounds of food a day. Exactly, yeah. And where does it all come from? It comes from all around the world. We feed our animals the same kind of seafood that we feed our guests, so it's all top-grade seafood. In Dubai, even, the aquarium food is top-notch. Yes, it right? is. Yeah, Nothing yeah, we, but the best. We don't mess around in Dubai. That's, that's awesome. Sure. <laughs> the hardest part of maintaining a tank filled with hungry sharks, if you don't feed them enough, they'll eat the other fish. So you actually have to go in there with them and feed them? Yes, and that's what we're going to be doing this evening, so we'd like to come with us. Into the tank? Absolutely, yeah. I'm in. I'd love to do it, yeah. Yeah, great. OK, so what's the process? Just chop away? Yeah, yeah, we're just chopping. You want to grab yourself a squid? OK. Yeah, there you go. There's a knife. Is there any rhyme or reason to this? Any part that doesn't go no, in? No, that's fine. All of it. Everything, eyes. I'm starting now to reconsider whether you have the best job in Dubai. <laughs> yeah. Oh, sorry. That's just, OK. I hit that eyeball, and it really just kind of exploded out there. After cutting up all this squid, I can definitely say that I will not be ordering the all-you-can-eat calamari special anytime soon. Okay, great, let's go. Okay. We grab our bag full of squid, get into our wetsuits and scuba tanks, and head to the top of the aquarium so Rob can explain which fish to feed and which to avoid. I should probably pay attention to this. All right, so what do I need to know here? So there are a couple of animals in there we don't want to hand feed. That's our big black tip sharks and uh, gray reef sharks as well. They've got slightly sharper teeth than the other ones, so we don't really want to be hand feeding those guys. Uh, perfect. Yeah. yeah. OK, so avoid them. Yes, avoid those. All right. We finish putting on our gear, dive in, and head for the feeding area. OK, systems are good. Ready to go? Yeah, ready to go. I'm instantly transported to another world. Look at that. It is beautiful in here. It's gorgeous. How many fish are here total? We have 65,000. 65,000? Yep. Amazing. There are even mysterious ruins down here, modeled after, what else, the lost city of Atlantis. I'm not the only one admiring the view. The restaurant is right there, just staring at me. Can I bother these people while they're eating? I'm sure they'd love to. <laughs> sir, sir, I want some wine. Save some wine for me. Yes. All right, enough fooling around. It's time to get down to this feeding business. OK, so we're just going to set down onto our knees now, Josh. OK. Yeah, I've got the squid. Just want to feed this one sting right here. Okay. God, they're not shy, are they? God, they're everywhere. They're hungry. Before long, our little drive through diner attracts some unwanted attention from the gray reef sharks. Well, careful, here comes a shark. One bite from this predator, and it's game over. So with about 10 hours to go before sunrise, the night is young, and my experiment to explore Dubai in a single night is about to get even fishier. How much is this piece of fish worth? It's worth about $1,000. I'm in Dubai for an experiment I've always wanted to try, exploring the city in a single night. 
I've got about 10 hours to go. And right now, I'm helping the staff of the aquarium at the Atlantis Hotel feed their fish. Well, careful, here comes the shark. And the meanest one in the tank is coming right for me. The gray reef shark moves on. OK. But this harmless nurse shark still wants to get chummy with me. Hey, do you want to feed the shark? Uh, sure, <laughs> sure. OK, there you go. Look at that. There you go, you just fed your first shark. Still have 10 fingers. Okay. All is good. Good. Maybe I better quit while I'm ahead. That was outrageous. <laughs> to go to work in that every day. I'm jealous. <laughs> it was an amazing hands-on experience at the bottom of a simulated sea. And let's not forget, Dubai is built in the desert, where there is almost zero annual rainfall. Yet everywhere you look, you see water. Fountains, waterfalls, even theme parks. Where does it all come from? Without water, Dubai couldn't exist. The solution? massive desalination plants on the shores of the Persian Gulf. Every day, 564 million gallons of seawater is turned into fresh water. The process keeps Dubai alive, but some say it's killing the planet. The emissions from these monsters give Dubai the largest carbon footprint of any city on Earth. Controversy aside, I've got a lot more ground to cover before dawn when I'm due to be in the desert with a team of adventurers who are testing a new tourist attraction for the very first time. If it works, they'll make history. But first, I'm meeting my next contact all the way across town. And I need a set of wheels to get there. How are you? Yes, sir. This is, not for you. This is me? Yes, sir. Oh, oh, thank you. And just like the hotels, the rental cars here in Dubai are pretty badass. <laughs> Yes, this is the car I've always deserved. Only in Dubai is your rental car a $250,000 automobile. And as it turns out, the one I'm in tonight is literally fit for a king or a ruler. Now this is a ride. This is a Mercedes AMG G63. It is really popular here because it's actually driven by the ruler of Dubai. And car culture is a big deal in Dubai. The streets of Dubai are like a high-end car convention in motion. Everywhere you go, it's like a fantasy showroom. A not-so-subtle reminder that in Dubai, one in every 100 residents is literally a millionaire. And the man I'm on my way to meet knows almost all of them. Their pleasure is his business. Anchor. Hi, Josh. How are you? I'm great. Nice yeah, to meet you. Very nice to meet you. Anchor Baga is the Wizard of Oz of Dubai. He's got the city and everything in it at his fingertips. The rich and powerful people here don't just know Anchor. They've got his number on speed dial. I'm really intrigued to uh, learn about what you're doing. Uh, yeah, here. absolutely. Come on, let me show yeah, you. For sure. Discretion is the key to Anchor's success. But tonight, the wizard has agreed to give me a look behind the curtain. If you've got the money, Anchor can get you whatever you desire. He's got a whole team of people fielding calls day and night from clients with very specific and often very unusual requests. Now, you've worked in the concierge industry in other countries as well. Yes, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So tell me about this job in Dubai. What makes Dubai it's, special? It's the nature of the requests. We actually had a guest, and he was like, yeah, listen, I'll give you half an hour. Can I have three red Ferraris out here? When he was driving the Ferraris, he pulled up to the side of the, side of the road, rang me again, he says, once I'm back, I want to do a private skydive, so can you get a speedboat to come and pick me up? This guy's my hero. Ah, he's my hero. <laughs> this is incredible. What's the largest thing that you've provided for somebody? Uh, the largest thing would be for actually a resident out here. She wanted to have a phenomenal Sweet 16 birthday party, so we got the largest yacht available. It can take in a maximum of 80 people, but her guest list was 120. So what we ended up doing was we chartered two of the yachts and we got the three of the yachts together. That so, sounds that sounds a lot like my 16th birthday. Instead of three yachts, though, I just sat alone and played video games. <laughs> but it was very similar to that. Once a request comes in, it's immediately dispatched to a mobile army. A roving fleet of concierge soldiers at the ready to deliver anything and everything to some of the richest people in the world. And tonight, I'm joining the team. 
So how do I fold into this yeah, crazy world? You've, you've come at a very good time. I have this very, very important client that is in Dubai once a month, and he has this particular request. You know, it's, uh, it's like this. This, good, this is a good client. Uh, this request, you just get it done. Anchor agrees to let me run a VIP mission. He won't tell me exactly what it is, but he says it involves delivering something I've probably never seen before to a very wealthy client. What happens if I screw this up? Well, I will get a phone call even before you screw this up, because okay, we will know that you're probably screwing it up. Okay, so I should just head straight to the airport. Absolutely. Get yes. out of town. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In other words, don't screw it up. No. <laughs> All right. Let me have your number. I'm going to okay. text you the address. No pressure, right? Armed with an address and the name of someone called Naz, I'm sent out on part one of my mission. Not only is the client waiting, but my countdown to sunrise is now at less than eight hours. My GPS takes me to my first destination. I'm expecting something upscale, but I end up here in the basement of a parking garage. Maybe this luxury concierge business isn't all it's cracked up to be. Hi. Hi. Are you Nas? Yes, Josh. Yes. I've been expecting you. Please follow me. I'll show you the way. Someone smarter than I am once told me, if you have no idea what you're doing, just keep your mouth shut. After the world's longest elevator ride, I'm surprised when Nas leads me through the service entrance of a bustling kitchen. Turns out the package I'm about to pick up is being prepared by a famous chef. Be careful, don't burn yourself. Chef? Hi. Chef Farouk Kambada is world renowned. People travel thousands of miles just to taste his one-of-a-kind dishes. Encore says you have something for me. I'm going to make this dish called Life of Nemo. Life of Nemo? Yes. OK. The package I'll be delivering to my VIP client okay. is actually the finest grade sushi in the world. Do you want to try tubing this tuna? Do I want to try? Yeah. I might ruin it. Please don't. It's an expensive piece of fish. OK. Uh, so. How much is this piece of fish worth? It's worth about $1,000. Okay, so here we go. Right here? Sure. As I cut a slice of tuna that costs more than my round trip ticket to Dubai, my experiment to experience this place in a single night is down to a little more than seven hours. And it's about to get really, really weird. I'm in Dubai on a personal mission to explore this city in a single night. With a little more than seven hours to go, my journey has surprisingly led me to slicing up sushi for a single dish that costs more than most people spend on food in a month. How much is this piece of fish worth? It's worth about $1,000. Okay, so here we go. Okay, ready? Okay. Two centimeters later. Here? I don't know. Can you slice tuna? Just slice it down this way. Just this way? Yes. See, that's why you're the chef and I'm the guy delivering the chef's food. <laughs> What's the most expensive dish that you serve? It's the grade nine uh, bagu that we get from Japan. It's grilled on this beautiful hibachi. Do you want to taste some? Do I want to taste some? Yeah. Absolutely. Sure. I'm not entirely sure what grade nine wagyu is, other than some kind of beef and probably delicious. This is basically the, the finest beef in the world, right? It is, for sure. And it is, it is resting on a hibachi that is being powered by a tiny, old-timey fan. All right. Awesome. How much is this beef worth? $350 a kilo. $350. OK, great. OK, amazing. Thumbs up. That's insane. It's like melting in my Just mouth. Just melting it. That is the best piece of meat I have ever eaten. Fact. I never want to leave this kitchen. I just want to stand here and steal this from you every night while you're not looking. With the clock ticking and my VIP client waiting, 
Chef Farouk gets busy preparing what might be the world's most expensive takeout. The pricey tuna goes into a bowl mixed with pricey sake, soy, and ginger. Simple enough, but you know what they say, presentation is everything. So we've got this lovely mini aquarium. Yeah. It's a mini aquarium? Yeah. And we're going to garnish it with a couple of fishes from there. I'm sorry, a, a fish is going in there? Yeah. Okay, that's crazy. Chef gives me the honors of selecting two brave fish who, if my intuition is correct, will not be returning to the ocean tonight. And a butterfly. That is officially the craziest sushi dish I've ever seen. It's this beautiful sushi in a dish with live goldfish underneath it. Isn't there something sort of sad about the fish underneath their dead chopped up cousins? It's nothing. It's watermelon. They don't know. They're fish. They don't know. All right, chef, thank you very much. I will guard this with my life, and I will not kill the goldfish. Bye-bye. OK, I've got the fish. Step one accomplished. Now, where do I take this thing? I text Anchor, I have the package, and he texts back the name and address of a nightclub and the name of a client, Ravi. Just Ravi. Raw tuna, live goldfish. This is officially the weirdest night of my life. Hey oh! Little fish humor there for you. Is it legal? Can you drive holding a bowl of goldfish? I think you can just do anything here. That's the sense that I'm getting. Actually, laws are pretty strict here in Dubai. It's a Muslim country under Sharia law, which means things like public drinking, displays of affection, or skimpy clothing are not just frowned upon, they're illegal. But as I arrive at the address, I discover that even in Dubai, rules were made to be broken. Okay, I'm in. Now how the hell am I gonna find my client Ravi in this mayhem? I've given myself just 12 hours to explore Dubai at night, and I've got just over six hours left. Right now, I'm on a mission to satisfy the world's most expensive late night snack attack. I'm making a delivery for an exclusive luxury concierge service, and I have to connect with some guy named Ravi. With the life of Nemo literally in my hands, I head for the VIP section. afford to have the finest grade sushi hand delivered to a high-end nightclub ridiculously wealthy guys like Ravi and they're all over modern Dubai Enjoy it. older generations here are more conservative in showing off their immense wealth but the youth culture is all about flaunting it drinking expensive champagne wearing jewels and designer clothes and spending more on one evening of partying than most of us do on our rent with my VIP concierge mission complete, maybe I'll just stay here for the rest of the night. Or not. My ears are ringing, but I'm back on the road. With only four hours before sunrise, I've got a few more stops to make. I make my way north through the city and across Dubai Creek. After a 20 minute drive, I reach my destination on the banks of the inlet. This is one of the busiest outdoor markets in Dubai. And it's this time of night when you can find all the best deals. The Arabic word for this kind of outdoor bazaar is called souk, which literally means narrow. Stroll through the endless maze of tight corridors here, and you'll quickly figure out how the souks got their name. If you really want to know what makes a place tick, there's no better place to start than in its markets. In just a few crowded alleys, you can find an entire city represented in miniature. Every ethnicity, every language, every cuisine, all waiting to be discovered. One of the 
things you notice walking around here is that these souks literally glitter. And that's because Dubai is absolutely dripping with gold. What's astonishing is that they don't actually produce any of it. They just import it by the ton. In fact, nearly 70% of all of the physical gold that was traded in the world last year was traded right here in Dubai. Hello, brother. Hello. Do you have any, um, do you have any gold here? Yes, you see, brother, all oh, this gold. What are you, too much? I can pull this off, right? No, it's a little much. Do you know who Mr. T is? I look like Mr. T. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How much is this? 17,500. OK, here you go. What's the most expensive piece of jewelry in here? Yeah, I have that one, the outside. It's three million and six hundred thousand dirhams. Three million six hundred thousand dirhams. Wow. Okay, I'll get that Travel Channel credit card out. Here you go. Okay. Get something nice for yourself too. <laughs> I may have maxed out my company credit card, but not to worry. There are less expensive souvenirs here as well. What is this? This is alum. What is it? Alum. Alum? Aftershave using. This is for aftershave? Deodorant. This is deodorant? Yes, deodorant. Just like this? You put it yes, on just yes, like this? Yes, deodorant. It looks like it's uncomfortable. Yes. Yes, very. Yes. Very yes. uncomfortable. Curly, jasmine, chamomile tea, and this one? Marijuana. No, marijuana, my friend. Smell it? That's high grade marijuana. Mint. Oh, mint. Yeah. Mint. A mint. In recent years, this outdoor market started staying open late at night, so visitors like me can browse for bargains in slightly cooler temperatures. Oh, my God. Sir, you're a saint. If you really want to beat the heat, do what the locals do and rock a headscarf. Oh, yeah? For me? Yes, for you, I give you cheap price for you. Okay. The Kefia has been in style here long before Dubai built its first skyscraper. Back in the day, the nomads who roamed the desert used them to protect against the unrelenting sun. Today, they're used to pretty much do the same thing. This is gone. Go. This is Gatra, this is Gatra. Uh -huh. You're looking young man. I'm looking young? Yes. Yeah, how much? This just is the bought 1,000 dirham for you. It's okay. 1,000 dirham? <laughs> Sir, are you okay? <laughs> are you okay? This man's overheated. With only a few hours left before sunrise, I'm looking to find a true taste of Dubai's traditional past. To find it, I need to go where my adventure began, back to the heart of the Arabian desert. Just outside the city, I've arranged to meet with a local adventurer who will help me navigate the desert at night. Sam. Hi. Josh. Nice meeting you. Nice meeting you too. Oh, thanks. And he's got a special set of wheels for the job. This is, I'm obviously asleep right now because this is like my dream. These vintage cars may seem like a dream, but where I'm going in one of them, you have to see to believe. How cool is this? And before this night ends, I'm gonna get really high. Come on, girl. Want even more after dark? Then head over to TravelChannel.com for exclusive photos, never-before-aired footage, and more. My experiment to see Dubai from dusk till dawn has led me to the outskirts of the city, where I've arranged to meet with Wassam Farajala, a local adventurer who knows this desert like the back of his hand. He's agreed to take me to a secret oasis in the wilderness that, according to Assam, is like stepping back in time. And he's got the right vehicle to help set the mood. Are these all Land Rovers? Yes. All vintage? Yes, all vintage. We have 1948, 1950. So late 40s, early 50s? Yes. I'm obviously asleep right now because this is like my dream. Yes. <laughs> this is my dream lineup of cars. How many do you have? We have 23 so far. Oh, my Lord. That is extraordinary. They're beautiful. They're in incredible shape. You want to pick one? Baby blue. Yes, that's good. Yeah. Let's do it. Curves like a kitten. This is incredible. Vintage, open top car, under the stars, crescent moon. Middle of nowhere. Who could complain? 
Have you ever tried driving on the wrong side of the road? Yeah, I, I'm always driving on the wrong side of the road. I, I travel so much that I end up going back and forth all the time, and to be honest, most of the time, I can't even remember which side is right anymore. Ah, well, we got used to it, because we <laughs> drive these cars every day. Right. Only 50 years ago, Dubai didn't exist, and I mean that literally. Where the city stands today, there was nothing but dunes, wild camels, and desert scrub. The only inhabitants? A nomadic people known as the Bedouins. Today, the Bedouin camps are gone. Their people and their way of life replaced by a thriving city. This land that we're driving on now, public land? No, it's a royal retreat. Uh -huh. Belong His Highness Sheikh Qutb bin Jum'ah Al Maktoum. So this and... is royal land? Yes. So where are we headed? A place deep in the desert where Bedouin life continues today as it did 50 years ago. And tonight, I've got an exclusive invitation. How cool is this? the traditional way with an offering of rose water to rinse off the desert and a little something to help me power through the rest of the night a strong cup of Arabic coffee thank you please holding court at this Bedouin camp is a man they call Uncle Hamad he was just a boy when the bright lights of Dubai took over the desert first of all thanks for for agreeing to sit down and talk with me I appreciate it I am also very grateful for talking with you. When you were a boy, what was it like? My days as a child started off with feeding the camels and drawing water from the ground and taking it back to my village. When people think of Dubai, they think of skyscrapers and luxury and it's a very modern city. Do you miss a simpler time? I am amazed by Dubai. It is like a mirage. It is the result of imagination, vision, and willpower. It gives me pride, but we have to remember where we came from. We must preserve the knowledge of the desert and honor our heritage. Uncle Hamad isn't the only one keeping Bedouin traditions alive. For hundreds of years, making flourless flatbread was critical to Bedouin survival. Now, I'm getting a crash course. You have to be very professional doing it. And of course, Samira uh, le ah. learned the same from Thank her. You. Hi! Ha! God, Samira! <laughs> she handed me something it's boiling hot. hot. <laughs> You're gonna love it. God! So normally, we normally have this. Come on, it's literally burning my hands off. <laughs> Samira, easy. <laughs> The bread is delicious, and while I'm no chef, the process seems pretty straightforward. Stop, why are you laughing? This mirror is supposed to be helping me and teaching me and guiding me here, not just laughing at me. All right, this one, this one did not come out well. Oh my God, this is why I'm not cut out for the desert. Look at this, look what I made. I'm not having that. <laughs> it's beautiful. <laughs> The bread is just the beginning. It's time for the main course. With less than two hours before sunrise, my famished crew and I are treated to a traditional Bedouin meal, rice and lamb, cooked in a pit under the desert sand. My crew might be starving, but I think they like it. This is not bad. <laughs> With bellies full, Wassam and I make new tracks in the desert sand towards my final destination. It's just past 5 a.m., and the rising sun is only a few degrees below the horizon when we arrive at our rendezvous point. Tonight, or should I say this morning, falconry expert Peter Berg and his team are attempting something that has never been done, 
and I'm lending a hand. As well, who's this? This is Bomber. Bomber. Wow, beautiful. Falcons and hot air balloons. Seems like a weird pairing. Peter and Bomber have been training for this moment for the past several months. If they succeed, it will be the world's very first release and catch of a falcon from a hot air balloon. If they fail, well, let's not think about that. Step one, inflate the balloon. The timing here is critical. Bomber needs a small amount of sunlight to perform, but the balloon can't fly after the sun rises too high and heats up the day, leaving us a very narrow window before our balloon drops from the sky like a lead weight. And without warning, the flight crew is ready to go. Okay, guys, get in. Get in, Josh. Go get ahead, in, Josh. Ahead. Get into the basket. Yes. Yeah. Okay, guys, welcome on board. Thank you. Bye bye, guys. Thank you. Bye. Once off the ground, we quietly ascend over the desert below, and the view is spectacular. As we make our way toward an altitude of nearly 4,000 feet, we review the plan. If there's one thing I've learned in Dubai, it's that this is a place where anything goes. It's, it strikes me that this kind of a project Live Falcons, hot air balloons could only happen in Dubai. Yeah, right. If it works, this will be something where guests can come up here, not just have a balloon flight, but have this really intimate experience where they see a falcon in flight and recover it. Exactly. In, in one piece. Josh, <laughs> don't be a scaredy cat. It'll be fine. <laughs> and has this been tested here in Dubai before? This is the first time ever. This is the first time? You're right, you're right. <laughs> OK. What are the odds that it goes terribly wrong and the bird flies directly into the balloon? I mean, it's unlikely that that's going to happen. Unlikely. For hundreds of years, the Bedouin people used the falcon to help them hunt for food. Today, the bird is a national symbol of heritage. With the sun beginning to crest the horizon, I put on my glove, hoping to make history and hoping this bird doesn't rip my face off. OK, guys, 3,900 feet, leveling out, ready to release the birds. Yes, yeah, go. Cool. Right, she's coming back. Okay, you can put your glove out. Initially, the hot air blasts scare the bird from flying too close. But before long, she comes back around. Here she comes, guys. Josh, is all yours. Come on, girl. I'm 4,000 feet over the Arabian desert, playing guinea pig for a team that's cooked up a new way to attract tourists. But it turns out catching a falcon in flight is a little more complicated than you'd think. Here she comes, guys. Josh, is all yours. Come on, girl. Yeah! Well done, well done. Hold it tight, hold it tight. Ah, sorry. I think we're gonna get her now, okay? Like this, there we go. She's, you've got her, you've got her, you've got her, you've got her. Ooh. Trying to steal She's your food. Good, yeah. These birds are picky, and it can take a long time for them to build up enough trust to land on a particular hand. Oh. But with the sun heating up the desert air, we're out of time and need to start our descent. But not before one last try. Here she comes, guys. Oh. <laughs> Look at that! Oh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Great job, Bomber. Perfect. Awesome, awesome, awesome. With the success of our test, this exhilarating combination of bird and balloon will soon have adventure enthusiasts flocking to Dubai for a one-of-a-kind experience. How many people can say that they caught a falcon in a hot air balloon? 
No one. Our celebration doesn't last long before the flight crew hurries our descent. So guys, we are just going over the power lines. After power lines, I look immediately for a landing area. Sorry, did he just say power lines? Our pilot may not have the warmest bedside manner, but he did get us down in one piece. Hey! Captain, I can't help but notice that we appear to have crashed. <laughs> Josh, Josh if, it was, if it were a crash, you would know the difference, trust me. Yeah? As I climb out of the basket, I'm just happy to be alive. Thank you. Sorry about that. You're right. Hey. <laughs> this guy's crazy. This guy's an insane person. All right, good. Great work, guys. My experiment to experience Dubai in a single night was one I won't soon forget. I arrived here knowing very little about this place and unsure if one night was enough time to get properly acquainted. My 12-hour trip took me from great opulence to great heights. I met the movers and shakers who greased the wheels for the rich and famous. And I witnessed firsthand how one of Dubai's greatest attractions takes care of its nightly performers. But in the end, it is Dubai herself that stole the show. A mega metropolis that rose up from nothing in the blink of an eye. Hotels are built on man-made islands here. Buildings give new meaning to the word skyscraper. And if you've never traveled here, don't worry. By the time you do, Dubai will have built something else unlike anything you've ever seen.